Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Cybersecurity Sauna. Thanks for joining us for another session where we sweat out the hot topics in security. So welcome to all our listeners and be sure to follow us on Twitter at hashtag CyberSound. The internet seems to be changing from being a relatively unrestricted space into something more regulated. More countries are implementing policies that restrict or filter the way their citizens experience the online world. Is the internet we know and love breaking up into many internets along geographical lines? Is true internet freedom a thing of the past? Here today to discuss this and to peer into the future with us is F-Secure's Tom van de Veel. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. So the internet is not just the internet anymore. It seems to be fragmenting from under our feet. Well, uh, not only that, but the truth is that the internet has never really been as open as we think it is, uh, even though the name applies or, or uh, tries to suggest that it's always been free and open. Uh, but the truth is that the internet always has been filtered or limited uh, in some way. And that could be done commercially, but that can also be driven by political ideology. And it's the latter one that we're seeing more and more. Right. So what are some of the examples we're seeing about that? Well, unfortunately, the only real examples that we see right now in the media are the more extreme cases. Everyone knows about the Chinese internet and the Great Firewall of China, um, but also stories coming out of uh, states where there are certain dictatorships or where um, there's a certain limitation on political freedom. And of course, their um, governments are very burned on controlling not only the message going in and out, but also being able to kill internet access um, when they want to. Um, But the truth is that even in European countries and in uh, the United States of America, there are uh, filtering mechanisms that are active right now uh, when it comes to trying to stop and track um, terrorism, uh, pedophilia, things like that. So the internet you're using right now, or maybe the internet access that you use to download this very podcast, could have gone through some kind of filtering device that you might not be aware of. That's a very good point, because I think we often tend to think about things like uh, uh, in certain countries you can't use VPNs or uh, Kazakhstan was recently issuing a root certificate that they wanted everybody to use because they wanted to man in the middle their uh, HTTPS traffic, things like that. Exactly. Uh, And also, you know, there's the uh, United Arab Emirates where, for example, the use of VPNs and and voice over IP are kind of a, let's call it a gray zone. So certain... Uh, regimes and certain countries uh, have certain preference, preferences on what technology they want you to use, obviously in the light of the technology that they can control. Um, I think in the last year or so, there's been multiple hundred cases of, or hundreds of cases of uh, governments turning off the internet because there was a certain um, political protest that was going to go on or was brewing or just preemptively trying to kind of catfish certain people into certain Facebook groups, forums, to be able to detect how people are thinking, what they will do, and with that, trying to control the narrative. And that's extremely dangerous. What are some of the dangers in that? Well, the dangers are that um, you have certain countries that maybe have not had the same steady evolution of of, uh, technological progress, where all of a sudden a message coming out of a medium like Facebook, YouTube, that countries that have not been uh, kind of introduced to the slow introduction of, for example, smartphones, you know, the the internet in general, and all the news coming in, that they don't really have the tools, uh, or or dare I say the education, to be able to process things like fake news, disinformation. And that can escalate very quickly, as we have seen, for example, examples of of, uh, in India, uh, Pakistan, with WhatsApp, where a message gets out, it is perceived as the truth, uh, and in the end, people get hurt, or even people die because of it. Yeah, well, even in the Western economies, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to say that I know people who seem to think that Facebook is a legitimate news source. Unfortunately, it isn't, um, and it is all uh, kind of part of a uh, what we like to call in the industry a, a healthy information diet, is that you need diversity of sources. But unfortunately, in these days where news or the real news and real journalism costs money. Um, Everyone goes for the free resources, which means news is supposed to be quote unquote free. Uh, This puts a huge pressure on media companies and and, you know, uh, all the online clickbait that we kind of take for granted. 
Um, and with that, you get a certain yeah, sloganization of, of, of the truth. And that polarizes people. That is exactly what leaders want. The old divide and conquer still holds truth. Um, and that is what leaders want right now, is to control that narrative in a certain direction, to divide their people. Um, and unfortunately, you need to have um, some education or know how to read information to be able to tell whether or not something is kind of, you know, something being fluffed up with a political opinion versus are these really the facts or at least, you know, being able to read through the glasses, so to speak, that the journalists uh, had on when writing a certain article, a certain piece, a certain book. Oh, absolutely. So what are some of the arguments why regimes and, and countries are restricting uh, or filtering the internet? Well, they will say to the general population that, you know, we are the government, trust us, and we are removing these rights for your own protection. We know what's good for you. We know what's good for you. Um, but the fact of the matter is the people in the position of power want to keep that power. Mm. And that means being able to control what can be said and what can be read. And if one can control what can be said and what can be read, that means you can control how people think. If you are born in a regime like that or, or a, uh, a way of uh, thinking like that, then you will think that it is normal. And you will think it really is for your protection. And that polarizes people. And that's exactly what someone wants uh, if you want to keep uh, a certain government uh, in its current place, uh, not have elections, trying to spin the narrative to make the other parties look bad or, or even worse or try to uh, not have any, uh, let's call it outside influence come in, which is just you know information about what is going on in the world so that people cannot compare it with their own lives. So all in all, it's about control. But some of this argumentation is, is fairly compelling. Like, um, you know, we're doing this to not hand the Nazis a bullhorn. We're doing this to strop, stop the uh, uh, spreading of, of child pornography. Like these are things that I can get behind. Yeah, and of course, for for I mean, every country is different. Um, there are certain things that, of course, where, where we need some kind of filtering, like for you know, when it comes to the content you mentioned. Um, but in a lot of countries, we get into this slippery slope argument where countries want to stop hate speech, but you know, hate speech is also part of free speech. Mm. But knowing where to draw that line is very, very difficult. Um, I'm of the opinion that our freedoms or determining what is what is um, to be read and what is not to be read should not be set by technology companies located in California and the United States, True. which is kind of where we are right now. Look at Facebook, look at Twitter, trying to play the arbiter of what is considered decent and what is not. Um, I, I challenge you to post um, Renaissance art with naked bodies on, on, on Facebook. It will get taken down because of their policies. So you can fight that all you want, but and you can tell people to get off Facebook all you want, but this is kind of the way that people communicate. And if this is the normal way of perceiving the world, then anyone that is able to manipulate that has a real weapon in their hands. So what can we do to sort of open up the conversation and... and uh, start making informed decisions instead of like reacting on on fears and sort of our desire to be stay safe online. Well, one is to spread awareness that whatever you read and can see is controlled by the person who made it. So whenever someone says, I saw a documentary, well, that means that you saw a certain version of, of whatever it is through the eyes of whoever made the documentary. And the same goes for when we read articles, when we read books, if you only stick to one source, uh, that's very dangerous. So spreading awareness uh, is very important because there might even be, even be countries where awareness is not even possible. Mm. Uh, most famous example is the way that um, people are putting news articles uh, tied to uh, balloons and making them fly over the North Korean border. So people have something in their hands when it comes to information to compare to their current lives or the information being given by the government. So you try to disrupt by giving people other versions of the truth. Um, and as we all know, there's four sides to that. There's what the one person said, there's what the other person said, there's the truth, and there's what really happened. And so, but being able to give more perspective is really important. So I sometimes get the question about, you know, what, what, kind of 
iPad should I buy my my child or my nephew or whatever it is? And I would normally answer those questions with a technical answer. But right now, in the light of all the things that are going on in the world, where people are acting upon single sources of information, where people can be misled with you know injury, death, and, and destabilization as a consequence, um, I now recommend people to buy online subscriptions to newspapers and magazines with a minimum of two completely opposite viewed magazines or publications. It costs the same amount of money. It's not cheap because journalism has to be paid for uh, because it is important that we get local sources, that we have local journalism. So I'm pretty sure that iPad can, that new iPad can wait with a year and just teach your, your friends and family that there is more to one particular story, that stories come from a certain narrative. And then you need to look at different topics from different angles to be able, again, part of that, you know, good diet of, of uh, information uh, that people are able to make their own opinions rather than borrowing an opinion in kind of the the, the supermarket of slogans and trying to use that to, to divide people and, and countries. But you're talking about a very difficult topic, like people being aware of when they're being influenced. Now, you and I like to think that we know something about fishing people and influencing people in that context. So, And even still, we're like susceptible to fishing. Like somebody might be able to come up with a bait that would catch either or both of us. So like, how is it realistic to expect that people can sort of be able to identify when somebody is trying to influence them either purposefully or just because the newspaper they're reading happens to have an agenda? Well, it is certainly difficult and it comes with, you know, quote unquote training, which is just reading more. Not every time, not everyone has time for that. I, I, I completely agree with you with that. And it is difficult. Even, you know, major online publications sometimes get duped. Um, so it is really important that we... Uh, talk about whether or not something is based in facts, that it's not just assumptions being made or someone trying to uh, spin a narrative. Um, the other side of the medallion is that you get people who start questioning things that we've taken for granted, mm. which means you get people who are starting to challenge certain scientific methods yeah. or certain scientific facts that we all take for granted. Um, the flat earth movement or whatever it is, people who are get, get so obsessed by a certain source of information that it's very hard to pull them out of that that way of thinking. Um, so rather than trying to reschool those people or trying to bring them back to reality, let's say, it's really important that we do this from the ground up and to teach people at a young age that information is just that, information. There's always someone behind it. So trying to make that distinction and trying to try to keep the truth kind of in the middle uh, trying to, you know, not, not to make too many assumptions because, again, smart people also make mistakes. Uh, there's mispublications. There's the occasional prankster. It's just important that people don't take information for granted and start running with it and start spreading the information because certain stories start living a life on their own. And we want to make sure that information can be fact-checked. Um, but at the same time, we want to make sure that the fact-checking websites also don't start looking at things from a certain political perspective. Right. So this is a really, really hard topic. Absolutely. But let's get back to those uh, countries where uh, the internet and the access to information is being restricted. What are some of the things that citizens and, and hackers are doing to escape those digital shackles? Well, it depends on how they're being filtered or how they're being censored. Uh, if you think about China, everything is done by what we call the Great Firewall of China. Uh, and that's kind of a, a, a name for a collection of very large, um, uh, very large groups of people that will look at every single news source as part of a drip drip way, introduce information from outside of China uh, to Chinese uh, mainland citizens. Uh, it also means filtering any way that information could come in. Uh, and of course, there the bypass is, is VPN. Uh, but in certain countries, trying to evade censorship is already an offense on its own. So there we're kind of stuck between, do we want to stay in the open uh, and try to get information from outside that particular country or, or, or regime versus is there any way we can get the information in a way that the government can see it? So things like steganography, but the most common example is the use of, of Tor 
uh, or operating systems uh, such as Tails, which are um, created to make sure that whoever is using the operating system uh, has a certain level of anonymity so that once the machine is powered off, there's no trace of whatever someone was doing. Um, these technologies will get some, will give you some digital freedom, but only for the people that know how to use them. And the leaders of those countries know very well that there's no one solution with which you can just bypass everything. So they're trying to hunt for, you know, call them digital resistance fighters that uh, will try to spread, let's call it alternative viewpoints into the country. Um, we've seen these famous pictures of the IP addresses of DNS servers being spray painted as graffiti onto walls in, in places like Syria. Uh, so it kind of depends on what the censorship technology is. For those countries, it could be DNS-based. So DNS is the domain name service. We like names of websites, but computers prefer IP addresses. So you have the DNS service that will translate these names to the corresponding IP address of where the information is located. So these governments will provide alternative locations for these, not only to track you, but also to give you maybe alternative information, um, which is a very big euphemism for lies, or just turn off or, or what we call sinkhole the information. So then you have people spray painting alternative DNS servers, uh, Google's ones, um, to uh, make sure that people can get the information they need. But at the same time, you are making yourself vulnerable for detection because the moment you start using those, the government can also see that you're trying to evade their censorship and you might make yourself a target. But Google is not running that uh, alternative DNS service out of the goodness of their hearts. So what exactly is the role of companies in this discussion of freedom versus censorship on the internet? It's a difficult task for those kinds of companies to come forward and say, we've set up this service you know, uh, as part of uh, you know, digital freedom fighting. Um, there's always a commercial incentive. Uh, we've seen uh, the launch of the um, DNS servers or the DNS service of companies like Cloudflare to also say, give us all your DNS queries. That is not necessarily a good idea. So using VPN services um, that you can trust, um, which is also sometimes a question mark based on which services you use, uh, and being able to, uh, for example, talk to people who have communication with the outside world, usually it's it's in those ways that small seeds get planted uh, where more people can, can, can gather the information. But there's always a commercial incentive and it's us as, as users of these services, but also governments that need to keep these companies accountable as far as what information they're presenting to these people and to be able to make sure that uh, as we've seen in 2016 with the uh, U.S. elections, that a, a rivaling political party cannot just start buying ads or try to spin narratives and trying to confuse people that maybe are not used to having this, this major influx of, of information that is spun in a certain way. What about when those uh, commercial incentives these companies have sort of clash with optimal freedom like i'm not saying i'm in the same position as as these people who are being digitally oppressed in in certain countries but like when i when i try to log on to my uh amazon prime account through my uh, f secure freedom vpn uh it says you're logging through a vpn and we won't show you any content now i'm just you know doing that because i always have my vpn on but like there are other reasons why people might use vpns um, and this service is actively blocking that because of their own reasons. Yeah, so there's definitely countries where the use of VPN is still a gray zone. Um, making or using those services will result in you becoming a target. So then we kind of go into the second phase, if you will, which is using things like Tor or Tor bridges, which are, let's call them network connection points or nodes where you can point your Tor client, a program, towards and that network be it slow and be it controlled by whoever runs a tor node bridge let's not forget that uh, that way you can get information out uh, and you might be able to bypass certain filtering technology having said that tor is only as strong as the exit node where the, uh, the information comes out of so you can still uh, lure people to your own infrastructure and still try to compromise people there. 
Um, so it really is a choice of, do I want to get the information? How do I want to spread the information? What technology will I use? Uh, and am I making myself a target in any way? Because if there is a compromise of one of these services, uh, your, and in certain cases, your, your life might, might be uh, at stake. Same thing for your, your friends and family. But it is important that we, that we still support these kinds of, um, this kind of technology to make sure that information can get out and people get a different perspective. Even knowing that the information has been spun in a certain way or is written by, for example, a Western country or whatnot, it is still good to get the perspective and to make people think in a different direction. Maybe that's what I was thinking about, sort of the general attitudes. Like, I'm not saying this is a life or death matter for me, but like, I think it's it's a bit of a stretch for me to just fire up Tor just to be able to view my content if I don't quite trust my ISP. So like, is this part of the slippery slope? You mentioned that companies, for whatever reasons, are limiting our freedoms online for their own commercial reasons. And like, you know, today is not a big deal, but maybe somewhere down the line it is, unless we're very aware of each step. Um, certainly. And it starts, and we see this in the West, we, it starts with technology. Uh, take the... Um, now, net neutrality, that has uh, gone away in the United States, where you have technology companies like Google, um, but not limited to Google, where they are able to control not just the, the pipe, so to speak, which is the medium, but also the content. And that is very dangerous because I'm pretty sure that their services will be served up uh, within the, uh, the expected speed and availability, but they, uh, quote unquote, cannot guarantee the availability of, of, of other services necessarily. And that's really where it starts. So there's always going to be an incentive for these uh, companies uh, to make sure that whoever is using their services uh, think, act or buy in a certain way. Sure. Now, you and I are of a generation that can still recognize the sound of a 1200 baud modem handshake in our sleep. Um, what does the future of the internet look like? So what are some, some of the ways that people are going to be using the internet in the future? What's in your crystal ball? Well, we're already seeing now that if you want to bypass any kind of censorship or if you have any kind of filter set up, then as a government trying to control the narrative and, and filter people's connections, you want to create choke points, right? The, the internet kill switch, as it's called, is, a, is the best example of that. A major switch uh, where it's not really a switch, it's a proverbial switch where they turn off network connectivity to the outside world or, or whatever peering they have. Lots of governments are experimenting with those. So the natural reaction to that is some kind of meshed network where it's not just you know one choke point that you can block, but everyone can spread the information to anyone using this mesh network. But isn't the internet supposed to be that already? That's that that's how it's supposed to be. But we have loads of examples where in that mesh network, if you put a bad apple in there or a bad network connection, or you can lure traffic towards your endpoint. Um, then, of course, you're back to, to square one because there you can, again, control the narrative, at least influence it. So as we've been talking about you know, fake news and spinning narratives, the integrity of the information that you're sending from one point to the other is extremely important. So you want to avoid choke points. So as said, meshed technology, you know, let's say cell phones that you can put in a certain mode where now they don't need the central towers, which can be blocked by governments, but communication can go from phone to phone and that way find its way to its destination. We are now seeing experiments being done by, for example, space exploration companies or, or commercial, commercial space flight, where they intend to launch uh, satellites that will provide internet connectivity. Not only is that going to be a major disruptor for countries where there are monopolies when it comes to internet access, and the United States is the best example of that. You don't have to you know, go for, for a, a lot of other exotic uh, countries when it comes to that. So that is certainly going to uh, open the door for a lot of people to be able to get free internet access. With free, I mean free of censorship, where... Um, in the future, and this might be in the next 10, 20, 30 years, I don't know, where uh, with a pizza box sized antenna, you would be able to access the internet in a way that it, you know, quote unquote, cannot be filtered. Yeah. 
So you're not not in the mercies of your local monopoly internet exactly. service provider. Exactly. It might come in, in the next tw- 10 to 20 years or so, but I predict several, call them digital Arab Springs, for countries that right now are being filtered and censored. The question is, what will those countries do when all of a sudden they get this influx of whatever we call the internet today with its um, clickbait, its disinformation, its fake news, commercial interests, and all kinds of other stuff. It's, it's, there are people that even say, uh, as part of complicated studies, that we as human beings aren't even wired for this kind of information overload. Um, education and awareness are the two biggest things we can do there. But in countries uh, that we've been talking about where there is censorship, that awareness and the education simply isn't there yet. So technology is getting ahead of us. Uh, We're going to see some very weird uh, situations across the globe, I think, when those floodgates do get opened through, for example, uh, space-based internet. I know how that sounds, but it, it will become a reality. And we need to be ready to, you know, help our, our, our fellow internet citizens, so to speak, in learning how to digest this, this information overload and to teach that there are different sides to a story. I like that message of sort of responsibility that we all have. And also you're talking about sort of these, that you predict these grassroots movements spinning up all over the place, sort of demanding a more free uh, internet. It's almost like you're saying that at its heart, information wants to be free. Um, that's a, a pretty interesting way of, of, of putting it. Um, but sure, but as said, information is, is only as uh, impartial as the person who is, who is giving you the information. Um, but we want to be able to give people more choice. We want to be able to give people perspective. We want to be able to um, invoke a healthy way of questioning what you see in front of you, be it a picture, be it a video or a piece of information. And the truth can be distilled from that. Uh, And that's really what we should be teaching people. Even even in in the West, we experience that information is free, but the information that is free isn't necessarily the most valuable information. Again, it is sloganization. It is clickbait to make you click on things because journalism has to be paid. And unfortunately, a lot of people stay with that initial message, that initial slogan, and again, that polarizes people, and that's not exactly what we what we want. We want people with perspective. We want people that are able to digest multiple uh, information sources and make up their own minds, rather than copying the the mindset uh, of a government, a political party, of any kind of regime. Words to live by. You're talking about fully meshed networks, but from a security point of view, isn't there an argument to be made for choke points uh, about gaining visibility into the network traffic? It's actually a, uh, a network security best practice to be able to funnel traffic through a central point or a, range of an, or a number of central points to be able to see what is being communicated and does it align with you know a company's security policy or whatnot. But the same goes for the internet uplink or upstream peering, as we call it, which is all the connections a country has to other countries for their internet connectivity. Mm. So this is certainly the the philosophy that, that government leaders also use to control the narrative, is to make sure that they know exactly where all the communication is, uh, so that they they can install their, their filtering devices and filtering technology, um, which, by the way, is supplied by, by Western technology companies. So like in all things, there's a trade-off between uh, security and uh, sort of usability or freedom or whatever. Absolutely. As I mentioned, mesh networks. So uh, meshed meaning that every node or every party in the network talks to the other party to be able to get information kind of, you know, quote unquote upstream. Um, there, the integrity of the information is incredibly important because meshed means that anyone can be in that network, right. network serving you up maybe alternative versions of what you're trying to receive. So both have... Uh, pros and and cons, and obviously government leaders are trying to to leverage this for their own censorship purposes. Encryption to the rescue. Encryption is only as good as who holds the keys. Right. When someone says encryption, I say now you have a key management issue. Mm, mm. So encryption can certainly work, especially peer to peer, um, but then that shifts the risk towards the endpoint. 
So can you trust the endpoint again in that mesh network possibility? So imagine every cell phone talks to other cell phones instead of talking to a, 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 a mast. That's great, but no one can try and deceive you or try to change the information or, or uh, even try to deny you access to the information, which you can do still if you have some kind of mesh network. Um, the other downside of you know meshed networks for your own protection is that you can create outages where you can create certain islands where now the information is very select and very um, limited, which again, limited information might also be the difference between life and death in certain situations. So the last word has certainly not been written about this. We're going to see all kinds of different technology uh, being used by, you know, and the oppressors and people wanting to to bypass them. So this is going to be a, a, a cat and mouse game that we're going to see uh, go on for a very long time. I want to thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having me. That was our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and you can reach us with questions and comments on Twitter through FSecure with the hashtag CyberSauna. Thanks for listening.